We didn't make a video recording of our Palm Sunday service this morning, so I thought I'd record uh, for those who were unable to be present uh, something of what was said today. Uh, so you have that, that opportunity to share in that. And then on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, we'll also be posting on the YouTube channel and uh, the link on Facebook, uh, a short reflection uh, for those three days. And then on Thursday, uh, we'll have uh, an act of worship actually uh, again on online ready for uh, Good Friday when we'll be back in church. So uh, that's how things are going to uh, work out over the next uh, few days. The readings Mark 11 verses 1 to 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he'd looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, making a good entrance is important, isn't it? Uh, the events we've just dis heard described to us by Mark at the start uh, of, of this Holy Week uh, are usually termed the triumphal entry. Jesus is entering Jerusalem on a cult. And it appears to be a planned event. We even have the password to authenticate his vehicle hire. <laughs> uh, the Lord needs it. Uh, and uh, so that he didn't need a, an identity card to uh, gain access to the, uh, the, the, the animal. And it seems to have been done in a way to convey a kind of prophecy. The prophets of old would often do something symbolic that went with their message. Over in Matthew's Gospel, he's alert to this. Uh, he quotes Zechariah. 9 verse 9, which is one of the readings that we had. And there's a sense in which Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was a kind of prophetic action. He was saying something. Jesus appears to be entering Jerusalem in the spirit of an earlier age, when foreign oppression and pagan religion had taken its toll on that holy city. Here's a bit from the 1 Maccabees, one of the books of the Apocrypha, which you don't usually read in church. And uh, it describes Jerusalem being cleared of its occupiers. 1 Maccabees 13 at 50. Uh, they cried to Simon to make peace with them, and he did so, but he expelled them from there and cleansed the citadel from its pollutions. On the 23rd day of the second month in the 171st year, the Jews entered it with praise and palm branches, with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments, and with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. Then later on, uh, we know that the, again, the temple was desecrated and uh, offerings were made to Zeus and pigs were sacrificed on the altar, which you can imagine would be incredibly uh, distressing. Uh, for the Jews to witness. It was, it was a blasphemy. Uh, and when it was liberated again, uh, sure enough, they celebrate with palm fronds. Uh, uh, and that would have been in the collective memory of the city. Even if it's a bit lost on us, Jesus' arrival would have been seen as triumph, cleansing, victory. And it all takes place around the Feast of Passover, when thousands and thousands of people would descend on Jerusalem to celebrate that liberation from slavery of the people of Israel of old. Um, and uh, how they how they managed to leave Egypt and begin their journey uh, into the desert uh, to receive the law and then eventually enter uh, the promised land. But one of the paradoxes of Jesus' entry is that he 
arrives and sets up a set of expectations and then sort, sort of subverts them at the same time. For example, he goes into the temple uh, and he cleanses the temple according to uh, God, the other part of the gospel accounts. But he doesn't do it by rituals at the altar. He doesn't do it by uh, devotion with the priests, but he does it by throwing out the money changes, which isn't necessarily what would have been expected. He challenges the authority of Caesar by entering Jerusalem as apparently a king, uh, which is a deeply subversive thing to do and feed the national aspirations of the Jewish people of that time. But then he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's when a Roman coin is brought to him. He identifies himself with a kind of purist movement, we might call them, the Maccabean revolt, where people uh, endured terrible treatment in order to stay faithful to some of the basic tenets of their faith. And yet he spends most of a chapter denouncing the scribes and Pharisees, who were the people who preached purity. Uh, and uh, and of course, the zealots who we would regard as fundamentalist militants in our own modern parlance, that they uh, were deeply disappointed in him because he didn't uh, seem to want to uh, uh, take on or endorse any kind of armed uprising. So Jesus entering to Jerusalem seems to be a kind of judgment. It's it's the light shining. And if you remember from John's gospel, he says this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people of darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. You know, that moment when you lift a paving stone or something in your garden and there's all these creatures and they all scurry for cover and burrow into the ground and disappear because the light has shone in a place that's usually dark. Uh, and uh, humans react a bit like that under the scrutiny of uh, truth. The initial enthusiasm of the crowd shouldn't, dis shouldn't disguise di or distract us from what's going on underneath the surface. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. And people are shouting, save us, Hosanna, and it's all very celebratory. But it's a cry of an oppressed people as well. But the presence of Jesus exposes the true motives in people's hearts. Jesus is, of course, the one who can save. His name, after all, means God saves. Uh, but he is the real king before whom even the mighty Caesar will one day have to bow the knee. He will offer a perfect sacrifice on Good Friday, uh, more pure and more complete than the ones in the temple. But none of that is explicit here. He just comes in and his presence, in a sense, m means that other people reveal themselves uh, as a consequence. And the fickleness of the crowd is the obvious point to make on Palm Sunday, you know, the celebrations and then, of course, the shouting crucify him a few days later. But there must have been some real celebration. I mean, there must have been people who, who who were there maybe Zacchaeus was there going cheering on you know having transformed been transformed uh only a day or two earlier maybe the woman with that penny uh who, that she was going to put in the temple offering that Jesus would then say was an example to everyone so maybe she was there thinking I don't suppose Jesus would even notice me maybe the woman with the perfume in the jar was there holding on to that precious gift wondering if she'd have an opportunity uh, to use it. Judas was there. Was he optimistic? Was he hopeful? Was he, were things still in the balances in his mind or had he already decided it was all over? Palm Sunday confronts us with the presence of the person of Jesus and our expectations of him and our images of him uh, in, the, in our heads and the contrasting with the reality that we encounter. Now, is there a part of us that is threatened by his strong and gentle but unwavering presence? Is there a part of us that's ashamed when we're confronted with his purity? Is there a part of us that's disappointed by the expectations that we harbour that ne have never been fulfilled? Because that would have been true of some people. Is there a part of us that's fearful of following someone with such a sense of purpose? Is there a part of us that is afraid of being identified as the follower of someone uh, the powers of this world choose to execute? That's quite a scary thing. Palm Sunday is a paradox. We sing joyful songs to echo the crowd, but lurking under the surface is something deeply challenging, the exposure of what is true. 
On Good Friday, the penitent thief facing up to truth meant salvation. <laughs> For others, it would result in rejection of Jesus. For Saul, who eventually became Paul, it was both. And the rejection that was eventually followed by an acceptance. So as we celebrate today, Palm Sunday, as we enter into Holy Week, the question remains for us. Is Jesus the light of the world, one who draws us? Or is that light so frightening that we seek refuge and shade? True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah. Grant us the faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. <laughs>